turn my webcam on for just a moment or two so you can associate the face and the name. The face is not so important. So, hey, gang, I, I want to add my welcome uh, to uh, Alex. And I really appreciate your time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work through a, a little bit of information here, and then we're going to work hard to get you engaged and answer your questions and, and anything that you have uh, an opportunity say, hey, what, what do we do about this, or how do we handle that? Uh, I'm going to turn the webcam off. We may come back later on, uh, and that way we'll conserve a little bit of, uh, of uh, bandwidth. The presentation should be available to you, and I hope the audio is acceptable. If uh, there's a problem with audio, shoot us a chat message, let Alex know, and we'll do our best to, to adjust. Uh, my day job, uh, all of us have day jobs. Uh, my day job is uh, president of Gordon State College, which is a uh, university system of Georgia school uh, south of Atlanta. Uh, I see Zipa's on from Mercer. That's good. Hi, Zipa. Hope you're doing well. And we have a number of our Georgia chapter folks on. That's great. Um, uh, but also, we got folks from all over the nation. And I am uh, just delighted that uh, Alex was able to organize an opportunity for us to talk about chapter advocacy and chapter leadership. Because I tell you what, all politics is local. Uh, a long time ago, uh, uh, a guy named Tip O'Neill, a Democrat from Massachusetts, reminded folks, all politics is local. And even though your member or your senator may be in Washington, you influence them most effectively when you are talking to them in the district or in the state. Okay, so we're going to uh, begin the process. If there's a, if there are issues, let me know, and we'll we'll uh, we'll try to work back. Okay, so we're going to talk about advocacy. Everybody says, well, what is that? Well, really, very simply, it's sharing the Fulbright story. You know, sharing the Fulbright story with decision makers and what I'm going to call decision influencers. Um, you want to get to know the member. You want to get to know the senator or the congressman. You want to get to know the administration official that you're connecting with. If you have a personal connection, that's great. Uh, but it takes a bit of, of effort and time and um, uh, consistency to do that. So you, you have a story to tell. And advocacy is sharing your story. Why is this program important to you? Why is the Fulbright program important to you? Why is an investment in the Fulbright program a really win-win proposition for the United States of America? What's the good that Fulbright does, and how can we justify an investment? And then um, make it personal. What has been uh, the Fulbright program's impact on you? and on your organization, and on your profession, and on your career, and on your community, and on your state and nation. You know, one of the things I'm doing right now in preparation for Advocacy Days in March, I'm trying to find every president in the nation who had a Fulbright experience. And you know what? There's a bunch of them. And uh, those, when I say president, university or college system presidents, as, as they go about their daily lives, how did it impact them and their careers, and how can they pass that on to others? So what is advocacy? Well, it's telling the story, telling the story. Well, why do we do it? Um, well, we do it because not everyone has had the same experience that you have. By the way, I did my Fulbright in 1993 in Sweden. I was a senior Fulbright scholar. I'm a business type. I'm in, I was a former dean of a business school. My area is corporate information management. And, and so my Fulbright experience was very early in my career, as, as is often the case. But it set me up for the future. Now, let me say that most elected officials, I think we only have three members of the House right now who are Fulbright alumni. And I'm not aware of any members of the Senate uh, who are Fulbright alumni, but we have college presidents in the House and the Senate. We have uh, uh, academic deans and provosts and those kind of things. They understand education. But advocacy, the purpose of ag advocacy is to start with the basic assumption that 
the person you're talking to is not knowledgeable about the Fulbright program. They really don't know what it is or what it does or where it came from or its history or its legacy or its contribution. They usually don't know. So you start with the assumption that they don't know about it and you're going to inform them. And uh, you can say, well, I, I talked to my member last month or last year or last decade. The key is the decision makers change. Lots of new members in Congress. I was going through the, the committees and the committee structures. And uh, uh, in the committees that I served on in the House of Representatives a decade ago, man, out of the Education and Workforce Committee, which does all of uh, secondary and higher education and, and that side of the House, there might have been, uh, out, of, out of a 30 or 40 member committee, there might have been eight or so, maybe 10, who served with me. The good news is uh, they're, all, they're all senior on the committee now. But decision makers change. They're new members. Lots of turnover in staff. Lots of turnover in staff. And the way you build relationships is through the staff. And the members will change committee responsibilities and committee assignments. So it's a constant education process. Now, fundamentally, all we do in advocacy is build relationships. It's all about people. It's not about things. Uh, it's about money, but money is only the resource that we need to impact people. It's really not about politics. You cannot allow your personal political persuasion to interfere with your effective advocacy in the Fulbright program. It's really about peace and security in the world. It's really about America and the good that we can do in the world. It's not about whether you're a Democrat. It's not about whether you're a Republican. This is a nonpartisan, bipartisan, multipartisan issue. I know that, like many of you, it's a bit frustrating right now. Hey, what can I tell you? Politics is a messy business. And um, we're still, as an association and as, a, as an advocacy team, we're still struggling with how to uh, uh, approach the, the current administration and how they uh, view the Fulbright program and how they view international exchanges. There's some good things. Uh, I think uh, uh, Secretary Tillerson has had some obviously large international exposure and experiences and and I think his organizations and historically have been supportive of international workers and international exchange and so I don't know we'll see how receptive the state is uh, to our, our initiatives but we're going to work on it we're going it's about building relationships it's about communicating and it's about educating so uh, why now well okay uh, uh, March 15th, as Alex pointed out, is our formal Fulbright Advocacy Day on Capitol Hill. This is our second year. Uh, we had a really good year last year. We anticipate a stronger presence and a stronger impact this year. One of the things I think uh, John Bader, our executive director, is going to share with you is the response that we've gotten this year is so much more uh, uh, I wouldn't say positive, but they're willing to listen. They, they invite us in. They, they allow us to share our message. And, 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 and they don't say, well, I don't care about us. You know, we don't, don't show up again. But Advocacy Day is March the 15th. We'll have uh, our Fulbright team, our advocacy team, our alumni. We'll visit with members of Congress. We'll visit with officials in the administration. And we'll, we'll tell the Fulbright story. We'll tell the story. We'll ask for uh, specific things. One of the things we'll talk about in a minute is make sure you understand what the ask is. What am I asking for? Don't ever go to a member and not have something that you can specifically advocate for. Chapters. Those of you who are across the nation, you have, uh, in my mind, the most important role of anyone in supporting our Washington advocacy effort because advocacy has to start in your hometown, your home community, your home state. And it has to be a, 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 a 
process that, that works throughout the entire year, not just on March the 15th or not just uh, uh, on any one single day. Uh, I'll give you the, uh, I want to shout, big shout out to our friends in Texas and uh, uh, the chapter there who developed a, a great relationship with Congressman, uh, help me Alex, uh, Texas, Texas, who was at our annual conference and came and spoke. San Antonio chapter. Uh, it's a great San Antonio event. chapter, and it was um, Castro. It's Congressman Cad Castro of San Antonio. Congressman Castro, and uh, 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 we really had great relationship. But let me tell you what this guy. This is a member of Congress. Uh, uh, um, gosh, I can't remember. I can't remember his name. But you're right. He flew to Washington on a Sunday and, and, and met with us and shared his vision for um, uh, the value of international exchange and. Uh, and we really appreciate uh, the San Antonio chapter engaging members. So you need to kind of get to know your member. You know, email, call, visit on the 15th and before. Ask your member to be receptive to meeting with the uh, delegation from the Fulbright Association. If you can participate, we want you to come. If you can't participate, we want to ask you to encourage your Remember to meet with us. Now, we're setting up appointments now, <clears throat> so you need to get on the phone or get on the email and make contacts and say, you're going to be contacted by the Fulbright Association. I hope, I'd like to request that you meet with them and learn more about the Fulbright program. Ask them to support our initiatives. And we'll work with you and guide you through that process. Uh, it's, it's critical that our chapters reach out to your members. Now, this means whoever is your congressional representative. If you happen to live in Los Angeles County, you have 52 or 3 or 4 or 5 members of Congress that have some portion of that district in LA County. By the way, if you're in Georgia, you have what? 14 in the whole state. And they tend to be divided up. But those of you who are in Georgia, uh, your, your, your university your college and university, certainly you need to touch the member that represents your community. Uh, let's talk about what do we do and, and how do we do it. Well, one of the hardest things about advocacy is identifying a decision maker. Not every member of Congress is in a position to either make a decision or influence a decision. They may be a member but they're not on the committee of jurisdiction, they may not have a passion for it, they may not, uh, they may not uh, have a seniority associated with, uh, with a strong position. We have to understand that not all congressmen are equal. So junior members of Congress uh, will defer and really don't have much choice but to defer to senior members. Uh, the decision makers and the decision influencers uh, generally uh, have uh, have been there for a reasonable period of time and understand how things uh, function. You need to know who they are. Your member may not be one of the people that we would identify as a decision maker, but if we can get them on board, maybe they can influence a decision maker. Ultimately, it's going to be the chairman and the subcommittee chairman and the full committee chairman and then the leadership that are going to make things happen. And then, of course, uh, the administration, the White House, the State Department, the Department of Education, and others. Uh, you also, we've got, I'd ask you to uh, mute your, I'm getting a little bit of background feedback. If you, have your, uh, if you don't have your phone muted, please mute your phone. Catching a little noise here. Somebody's got a ruffle in the shuffle. Uh, let's look at uh, identify staff members that influence decision makers. You'll see a few initials after a bullet called Washington. So in Washington, every member has what we refer to as a chief of staff. That's the most important person in that office. And then for us, the LD, referred to as a legislative director, this is the staff member who is a senior legislative analyst. 
who directs the legislation of the office. And then they'll have a legislative assistant, the LA. The LA will, will, will be focused on an area. Oftentimes you'll be talking to an LA. You won't be talking to the chief of staff. You won't be talking to the LD. You'll be talking to somebody whose responsibility is this area of uh, legislation. And then the LC, the legislative correspondent, who just is a communicator. And finally, the scheduler, which is one of the most important people in the staff because they give you access or deny you access to the member. So you've got to develop a relationship with the scheduler, and there's very specific ways you do that. Now, in, in the district in, or the state, the state of the district, there's a state director or a district director, and then there are multiple field representatives that, that represent the member. So that in Georgia, Senator Isaacson has a state director and has multiple field representatives, and if you don't know their names, it's time. Today's, today's the day. So whoever is the field rep for your House member or Senate member, you got to you got to get a really close working relationship with them, and then you want to develop a, an engagement plan for your chapter. Uh, like the, you may be it since you're on this call, you may be the the advocacy chair or the advocacy coordinator. I hope you have a couple of three folks that work with you. You really don't need to try to do it uh, independently. But then you want to look for two or three opportunities over a year to inform and influence your decision maker. Now, are you going to get that member two or three times? No. You might get them once. But you'll get their representatives there. You should be able to get their representatives there for virtually every major function. By the way, if you invite them and they can't attend, that's not all bad. Because the next time you invite them, you remind them, I'm sorry you couldn't join us last uh, February, but we hope you can join us this April. If, if you keep asking, they will attend. They will show up. And they especially will attend when there's a, a, a stronger uh, basis for their engagement or the members' engagement. So develop a, a plan of engagement in your chapter. Um, get my slide to go. So, how do you do an engagement? Well, uh, you have to start early. I think uh, I, you know. I, I've I've had people say, "Well, I need to get a, I need to go uh, meet with a member on such and such." And, you know, uh, the answer is uh, advocating uh, today for the things you need today is very very late. Um, it's by the time that legislation moves to the floor of the House or the floor of the Senate, all the work is done. We're just counting noses. We're just, we're just trying to figure out if there's enough votes to pass the legislation or pass the, uh, the proposal. All the work has been done in subcommittee and then to committee, maybe multiple committees, and then ultimately when it's scheduled on the floor, it's, uh, it's something that, that likely the leadership of whichever party is in power, the leadership has determined that it will, uh, it will achieve sufficient support to move forward. Because I can't they're not going to put anything on the floor they don't think they can pass. They're not, they're not going to put something on the floor they think that, that it won't be, won't be uh, supported. Now, um, so you've got to start about six months before the engagement, and you have to start small, unless you're experienced. And if you're experienced, no worries. Just move forward. So think small initially until you have your relationships developed. Uh, again, several options. Uh, visit the member. Matter of fact, I always prefer to, to visit with folks certainly the first time you know, in the district or, or in, in my offices in the district or in the state. Uh, uh, I, I could give someone 30 minutes in Georgia and I couldn't give them five minutes in Washington because the schedule is so demanding, so very, very demanding. So uh, think about opportunities to visit your member at their office. They have district offices. They have state offices. They, they hold, uh, they hold uh, uh, open opportunities for constituents to meet with them. August is usually a good time 
Everybody says it's August recess. All that means is the members are home and they're working twice as hard as on an hourly by hourly basis as they might in D.C. Uh, invite the member or the staff to an event. Whatever you do, whatever whether it's a picnic or a banquet or a dinner or whatever, invite the member. By the way, if the member comes, there's always staff. Now, when I was in Congress, I wasn't allowed to drive. I wasn't allowed to drive myself anywhere. I always had a staff member drove me. That staff member kept me on schedule. They moved me. Uh, you know, I, I was allocated X amount of time at each lot, at each location, and I had to move. They had to report to the to the chief of staff of the scheduler if I got off schedule, and that wasn't good. So invite the member and the staff to an event. Host the member as an honored guest. If you have a relationship and this person has done something positive for Fulbright. Recognize them. Recognize their contribution. So host the member as an honored guest or a speaker at an event. One great strategy is to, uh, if they haven't done anything or you haven't, you can't, you know, honor them per se. Think about asking them to attend and have them introduce or recognize people who have. Let them be the be the presenter. They they like to have the opportunity to. To, to have a good story, to do something positive. So host the member as an honored guest or a speaker at an event. And then finally, you know, certainly you can visit your member and their staff in Washington. We'd like for you to coordinate with our national office so we know when you're in town. We'd like for you to participate in our Fulbright Advocacy Day. Uh, and you're welcome to do that, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, I would suggest that it not be a casual drop-by thing. I would prefer it be a more organized and and, and scheduled event so that uh, the other thing is members don't like to be surprised. They don't want to be uh, they don't want to be uh, um, bushwhacked in any way. Okay, uh, a couple of three hints and we're moving pretty quick. Uh, the calendar is out, so you can check the congressional calendar. You can see when where members are going to be during the year. Usually, when uh, at the beginning of a Congress, we just started a new Congress in January, so it took a little longer to get the calendar kind of uh, put together. Leadership had to put together a calendar, but now you'll know when they're in Washington and when they're not. And you say, well, when they're not, does that mean they're in the district or in the state? And the answer is, it depends. Sometimes during those non-Washington uh, schedules. There, there may be field hearings. There may, may be congressional delegation trips. There may be, there's travel involved. There's activities. But I'd say 80% of the time, they're not in Washington. They'll be in their district or in their state. Uh, we talked a few minutes ago about uh, not all members are created equal. Uh, new members don't have the same sphere of influence. Members of the minority party. He, again, this is not political. It has nothing to do with politics. It, it has to do with the way Washington works. So, I can't go to a Democrat in the House right now who is a first-term representative.
if we don't craft it correctly. So one of the things that uh, uh, John, John Bader is working on, our staff is working on as they meet with members, is to refine the ask. Ultimately, you look them in the eye and you say, can I, can we count on your support for whatever the ask is? And then say nothing. Allow the member to respond. Allow the member to say, I'll give it consideration. I feel I can support this, or no, this is not in this is not in what I feel is in the best interest, and then you've got a harder sell. But make sure you, you make a specific ask. You make a specific ask. Um, Alex just shot me a text and says that they've lost internet in the um, Fulbright office. So I'm gonna I'm gonna continue with a, a bold assumption that everyone else is okay. I don't see a lot zipping through on the on the uh, text chat. But if you've got a problem, make sure you hit a text chat. Okay. Um, finally, uh, we're in a, we're in a member's office now. We're going to be in a member's office in about a month. Today is uh, the 16th of February and the 15th of March. We'll be there. I like to limit the, the group in a member's office to two to four people. Okay, it can be larger. I've had 20 and 30 folks show up, uh, although that's not really good. But <clears throat> two to four, three to five, something like that. Make sure you do your homework. Make sure you know who you're going to see. Make sure you know as much about the member as you possibly can. If he's your member, you ought to know him. Okay. Who does he know? Where did he come from? What was his professional life before Congress? What are his interests? What committees is he or, or she on? Uh, where is their passion? So, do your homework. Be five to ten minutes early. I'd say ten minutes early. I want you sitting in that outer office because you're going to be waiting anyway, but, but don't be late. Whatever you do, don't be late. We talked about talking points. We talked about staying on message. Uh, someone of that two to four, three to five group needs to be the spokesperson and then they need to be handing it off to other folks so that everyone has a chance to engage the member. But stay on message. Talk to the senior person in the room. If it's the member, make sure you're addressing the member. The staff will be the note takers. They're the scribes. Rarely will you be talking. If the member's in the room, you're talking to the member and the staff is the support. If the member's not in the room, make sure you've identified the senior staffer. So if you're, if you're in a room with a chief of staff and an LC, make sure you talk to the chief of staff. If you're in a room with an LD, make sure you talk to the LD, not to the LA or the LC. So always know the priority, the pecking order, so to speak. Always have your ass prepared. Make the member request. Make it straightforward. Respect the member's time. We talked about that. May have the push card with the key points. Make sure your request is on the card, on the leave behind, and that your contact information is there. Make sure that you get the staff member's contact information. Now, sometimes the member will offer their business card, but candidly all that is is their general number to their office. You get that off the web. What you want is the staff member's contact information and their role. So you will so because staff change so quickly, it's very very difficult to uh, to get staff uh, contact information that's current and accurate. You just have to you have to just work with them on a on a continuing basis. Um, take pictures. Make make sure you don't get out of that office without a picture. And by the way, they're going to take pictures of you being there, and you want to take pictures of you being there. Take a picture with the member and your delegation. Highlight it on your website. Push it out to social media. Make sure that their internal communications individuals know that. Members love positive press. So give it to them. Give them positive press. They gave you their time. You give them positive press just for listening. And then make sure you thank them formally. At, during the visit and also once the visit is uh, concluded and you're back at home. So make sure you come back with a thank you. Uh, moving right along, how do you schedule me? Well, <clears throat> usually uh, you can't just pick up the phone and say, can I come by? 
Actually, you, you, you really can't do that. Uh, you've got to go through their formal scheduling process. They have a scheduler, actually, in some cases. They'll have two schedulers, two or more. Uh, uh, one uh, scheduler will, will be responsible for all meetings in Washington, and another potential scheduler will be responsible for meetings in the state or in the, in the district. So if you're going to schedule a meeting with a member, you need to designate an individual that represents your chapter, connect the member's website. They almost always are going to require you to submit your request through some formal process. Don't be deterred. So you'll send them an email or you'll fill out an online form or you'll do something along those lines. All right? So you're going to, you're going to have to find a way to uh, connect with them, make the request. You can't even talk to the scheduler at this point until you've got a formal request or until you have a relationship with them. Re schedulers are hard to get to. Uh, field reps are not. Field reps, you can get to a field rep real easy. Identify their, their, their field representatives, their state field reps or their district field reps. Make sure you invite them to an event. Build a relationship with the field rep they can uh, can assist you in accessing the member. They know the scheduler. They can talk to the scheduler. You won't be able to do that. They know the chief of staff and the state or the district director, and, and you may not. They can communicate, and they can make sure the member knows this is important and this is something that, uh, that they need uh, uh, to help you with. So they'll get you to the member. They'll get you to the scheduler. You want to get to the field rep. If you're doing an event, if you're doing an event uh, with a chapter, uh, treat again, treat the member with great respect. Designate a host or an escort for the event. I realize this seems fairly mundane, but it's important. Consider a pre-event opportunity to have a chap to have the chapter leadership greet the member. When when I hosted uh, uh, major guest in the 12th Congressional District during my tenure in Congress, you know, when their airplane touched down, we had a we had a greeting party. Okay, um, you don't let the President of the United States come to your district if you're not if you don't have someone there to greet them, and you don't uh, or, or, or a cabinet member or a, a senior member of, of, of your party or senior member of Congress. So uh, make sure you have someone there to greet them to host them, matter of fact, maybe more than one, might have an opportunity for leadership to, to thank the member early on, make sure the member knows the purpose of the event and their role in the event, and that's through the, through the staff. You've got to make sure the staff understands the purpose of the event and the member's role in the event. Make sure they have <clears throat> some specialized seating, either at a head table or at a designated table. Make sure that you put key communicators with them or near the member so that you can get your, your advocacy communication in a more uh, informal environment. And then respect the member's time. Uh, a lot of times, don't expect, if you're having an event that's going to last four hours or two, even two hours, don't expect the member to be there the entire time. Uh, you know, we, we've got an event on campus here in a, a, a few weeks, actually right after I get back from Washington. We have the, our member of Congress coming. It's a foundation event. It's not a Fulbright event. It's a foundation event for our college. I hosted him last year when he was a candidate. Now I'm going to host him as the member of Congress. But I know that I'm going to be there when he gets there at 6 o'clock. And I know in about 6.30 to 6.45, he's going to slip out the back door and go home and introduce himself to his wife and his family because he hadn't seen them in, in eight or ten days. I mean, it's just that brutal. So don't expect the member to spend an entire event with you. Expect them to spend whatever time you need for them to be there to fulfill their role and responsibility. And so you have to be very respectful of that. Uh, most people don't understand that uh, uh, that members uh, spend uh, uh, virtually uh, uh, seven days a week, uh, sixteen to twenty-hour days. And uh, I, I, there was a time when my children, uh, who were grown, had to go to my scheduler to to get me some time off or to, to have a chance to spend some family time. So respect the members' time. 
if you're uh, if you have a chapter event and you want a member there, give them a formal row. We've talked about this. If it's a dinner, a banquet. Make them give them a part in the program. Allow them to speak, either as a keynote or in a more limited role. Ensure that their role, whatever their role is, they're briefed and they're prepared. If it's less formal, if it's a reception or a picnic or whatever, introduce them and allow them to make brief remarks. They they really really appreciate the opportunity to just to to share their their uh, their current status or quick update. Publicly thank them and like I say, take pictures and communicate. Take pictures, take pictures with the member and the officials. Highlight their visit. Make sure that they understand that uh, you appreciate them being there. Make sure that you appreciate them being there. Um, we'd ask you as you plan your engagement let the Fulbright Association know when you're when you're scheduling meetings or events with members or officials of the administration. Send us your photos and a quick summary report so that we can stay abreast of where you are. One of the things that John's going to probably talk to you about is a, a, a tool that allow all of us to share what's going on and what we're doing and how we can collectively uh, do a better job. Connect with our Fulbright staff. Uh, uh, Alex is doing a super job with our, our our chapter development. This is just one piece of that. I realize that advocacy is just one piece of what we do, but I appreciate her leadership and her work there. So connect with Alex or connect with Chaz, connect with John if you need assistance uh, as you prepare to do these kinds of things, and then make sure that uh, as you have a need, uh, we can help you with uh, the ask and the info cards and any statistics or anything that might happen uh, as you engage with, uh, with uh, members of the administration and certainly uh, members of Congress, your, your House and Senate, your House representatives and your senators. So uh, that's kind of where I am. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Alex. There you are. Hello again. And I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna mute mine and let you pick it back up, Alex. Thank you so much, Max, for going through those slides and letting us know step by step how we can all engage with advocacy for members of Congress in our local districts. Really appreciate it. We will have time to get to questions and answers, and I've made note of some of the questions we submitted via chat. So please keep those coming. Before we get to those. I'd like to throw this to John Bader, our executive director, so that he can let you know a bit more about the advice that we've been getting in our very recent with members of Congress who have had Fulbright experience. So John, if you'd care to join us. Sure. Can you hear me right now? Yes, we hear you. Fantastic. Well, uh, greetings to everyone. It's uh, it's it's a delight to to chat with uh, with all of you this afternoon. Again, many thanks to Max, who is uh, truly a treasure in our community. It's uh, uh, he is he is priceless, and we value his his guidance and uh, and his input as well as his enthusiasm. So many thanks to Max. Um, I just wanted to share for one minute uh, some recent experiences that I've been having. Uh, uh, which are exactly consistent with what Max is describing. Uh, all of the things that he has laid out for you are uh, happening in real time right now on the Hill all the time. Uh, and uh, Shaz and I and Alex uh, in various combinations have been going to the Hill in the last uh, couple of weeks as we set the table for our advocacy day getting a better sense of the strategic lay of the land and ch chatting with a number of important champions for the scholarship. Uh, so I, my first message to you is it's, it's a lot easier than it sounds. Uh, it, it, it might be a little intimidating to hear all of Max's advice, but as you process this and look through your notes, you'll see that it's very sensible. It's just about building relationships and telling your story, and it's really as simple as that. Um, we we are we do have an ask in in mind of 250 million dollars as part of appropriations. But it's, important, it's much more important that you're able to speak on behalf of Fulbright and tell your story and its impact on your community, on your life, on your career, and so on. That's 
that's much more meaningful uh, to strengthen the bond with Fulbright. Uh, and the last thing I would say is that uh, you're, wherever you are, either in the field or here in Washington, you're going to be dealing with people who are very engaged, uh, very public-minded, uh, uh, very open. Fulbright has great, uh, good friendships uh, all over the country on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the house, and uh, you're going to have a fantastic time of it. And just let us know how it goes. So enjoy and uh, and all the best. So thank you, uh, Alex, for including me. I'll I'll mute and 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 ring off. But um, uh, again, many thanks to all of you. Thank you so much, John. I'd like to open this up now to questions that you might have for Max. We've all muted our microphones, so just make sure to unmute if you would like to ask via VoIP via audio, or you can text via chat. And I will pause my webcam. If anybody needs to be unmuted, please let me know via chat or unmute yourself. What questions do you have? I, I can't imagine that it's uh, totally uh, quiet out there. What would you like to know? Okay, well, we had a... Someone, Alex, someone yeah. just came through and they said and they were muted. Let, let, me ask, let me ask the group a question, and maybe you could respond in the chat window. If you have hosted a member for a chapter event in the last year, would you share that with us, please, and just say, hey, we hosted congressman or senator so-and-so or, or their staff at this event at, around this time frame, just to give John and I and Alex an idea of how many of you have already gotten this thing going, okay? Can you share that with us? And while you're doing that, I, this is Alex speaking, I just want to bring up something that Susan Quinlan from the Georgia board wrote in to the chat. She mentions to all of the Georgia members that she has a former student who works for Johnny Austin. So I'd like to remind you all that those are wonderful connections that you should try to think about. Who do you know? What, who among your students became a staff member? Make use of those connections. Alex, I see that uh, Matthew Smith had a really direct question. It's a great question. If you notice in the chat room, he said, do we have a specific dollar ask for Fulbright this year? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to start with that one before I go to the second one. And John, um, John Bader, if you if you can kind of jump in as well. And, and candidly, Matthew, I don't know if you go by Matt or Matthew, um, the answer is we'd like, we're trying to figure that one out. Uh, we know what we'd like to ask for. Our problem is if our ask is unrealistic, we lose credibility. <laughs> Last year, our strategy was to ask for the restoration of funds to uh, 2010 levels. Is that right, Alex? Is that right, John? Did I hit the number right? And so basically, we used it. We used it as an opportunity to uh, to inform members that. Fulbright been cut. When they talk about restoring funds to 2010 levels and it was 2016, they get the message. Um, we're still not getting positive signals that the current administration is looking to expand investments in, in international exchanges. Uh, oh, in so, fact, uh, Max, if I could, if I could jump in here, jump in. Um, I'm I'm hearing the uh, a lot of anxiety and probably bad news for us uh, that 
uh, the president's budget um, may may ask for some significant cuts across the board, uh, especially in the State Department. Uh, so we can we can go in with a two hundred fifty million dollar ask, which is what I mentioned before. But um, it the chances are are pretty good that uh, the Fulbright will be cut at the same rate as other uh, as other State Department programs. Um, so uh, the the ask may turn out to be somewhat irrelevant um, in. In, in a larger sense of things, because once they set a high-level budget number, it's going to be hard for us to, to make our case. It's just important, really, to, to be as widespread in our approach that we're, we build as many friends as we can across the Hill that have a good feeling about uh, what Fulbright has to, has to offer the world. I, I want to concur with John. Uh, he, he's been in Washington for a number of years. He understands the political dimensions uh, in, in that community. Um, we have we've just begun the process of establishing uh, long-term relationships. And John and Chaz and Alex and others on our staff, uh, Nancy Neal, our president, they're they're beginning to at least have a more receptive ear. We've got to get to a point where we have uh, strong support. Uh, I don't know what the ask is going to be. We're going to have to settle that pretty quick, and we know that. And John and, and, and his folks are, are meeting with members of Congress. Uh, I think I think Shaz was meeting with Senator Crocker today. Y'all met with Senator Bozeman uh, earlier in the week or last week. Uh, 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 Dave Lobsack, who's a Fulbright alum from Iowa, has met with them, and they're meeting with Cole, who's a former colleague of mine in the House from Oklahoma. These are the people who can tell us what makes sense and what might not make sense. So I can't give you a specific number. We can say 250 million, we can say 280 million, we can say um, 900 billion, and the answer is we've got to be credible. We've just got to be credible. Now, uh, on uh, Matthew's question on uh, general foreign exchange ask, uh, that's the foreign exchange. That's the uh, the bilateral partners decision. Uh, we do. We have to be cautious that they're making that investment in us, and in supporting the Fulbright program on their side of the house. Uh, we have a number of bilateral so, agreements. Max, I, I've got something on that. Good deal. Um, so uh, the the Alliance for International Exchange has uh, has come up with an ask that we debated in a in a session about a week ago for 672 million. Uh, that's that's that that's the that's the running number right now. Both the 250 number and the 672 number we think hit that mark that Max is suggesting of kind of a mid range ask. Uh, nothing too big. Nothing so so modest as to look pathetic. Um, uh, again, this is this is a bit like making a statement rather than making an ask per se. You are there to advocate for the program and for international exchange. The ask is important but secondary. And if I could break in here, I'd like to relay a question to Max from the chat. Bob, the president of our Utah chapter board, is asking, Max, what committees should we target? Um, any committee that has uh, State Department responsibilities. Get ready to go for a minute. In the Senate, and John, help me with this, it'll be uh, uh, Foreign Affairs. And in the House, it's, it's internet. they call it different things, International Affairs. But any committee that has jurisdiction First of all, for the State Department, because that's where the, the direct funding comes from. Certainly, any members in your state that are on appropriations, you understand the difference between authorizing legislation and appropriations? Uh, so I can pass legislation in a, in a uh, committee that, uh, uh, that, that authorizes or provides the legislative underpinning for a program, let's say the Fulbright program, but I've got to appropriate funds for it. So uh, first of all would be anyone in that, in that international affairs, international relations area. Secondarily would be uh, anyone in appropriations. Certainly any members of leadership. If you've got a 
committee chairman anywhere, if you've got a if you've got the whip or the or the the, the majority leader or the speaker, if you if you're Mr. Ryan's district, I want to talk to you. And I know Paul Ryan well. But bottom line is, uh, we got to get Paul Ryan on our side. Uh, we we've got to get. Uh, uh, you know, Mr. Pence, I know Mike Pence. Well, ironically, the people I, you know, I know Pence, and, and I think Pence is one of those key influencers. I mean, he's right there, and I need him, and, and we need to get to Mike. And, and uh, by the way, uh, uh, Johnny Isaacson, my senator, those of us who are in Georgia, Johnny and David uh, Perdue are heavily involved in uh, international affairs and are in the right Ooh. place to assist us. John Max, Bozeman is critical. Max, if I may, um, so Shaz and I met today with uh, uh, one of the most important people on the Senate side, and that's Thad Cochran, senior senator from Massachusetts, uh, excuse me, from Mississippi. Um, so Cochran is the chair of appropriations. That's uh, huge. And huge, huge benefit. Now, he was extremely friendly to to us. We talked about the Fulbright. He listened very attentively. As it turns out, and this is a, a key for all of you and um, uh, from the Max playbook, as it turns out, uh, Cochran was a Rotary scholar himself. Uh, uh, frankly, I didn't know this. It's not available in his uh, standard biographies, but he went to Ireland on a on a Rotary scholarship, and we were able to talk to him about that experience for a little while. So. Uh, not only did we get to the chair of appropriations, but we found that he himself had been an exchange student. That's that's huge. I didn't know that about Thad, uh, and that's where we need you. Uh, one of the things that I need for you to do in your university and in your chapter, make sure that if you if the president of your university or senior member of your university had an international experience, we need them on board with Fulbright. Like I said earlier, make sure you know as much about the member or the official as possible. And like you say, Senator Cochran is critical. Man, he's chairman of appropriations in the Senate. That's unbelievably powerful position. We need friends in high places. Okay, and and that and, and by the way, we're not going to get where we need to be by visiting with Senator Cochran one time. And John knows that. And Shaz knows that, and I know that. But over the next period of years, now, by the way, we may not get what we want this year, but we have got to work toward getting what we need over the next several years. Kim Eager just walked in my office. He's on a on Fulbright uh, board. So, Kim, you're now. I've been listening. You've been listening. <laughs> Okay. That was close enough. I said, hell, I'm just going to That's right. So he's, on, he's in the house. I'll put him on the thing. But so so uh, bottom line is John and Shaz and Alex are doing a great job. I mean, uh, John, I, I heard y'all had a great visit with Senator Bozeman, and that is huge uh, because over time he will be the champion we need in the U.S. Senate. And uh, we've got a great guy in, this, in the United States House of Representatives, and Tom Cole, who I served with, who was a Fulbright alum, and we've got other members of the House. We've got great champions there, and I think that's just an amazing, amazing plus for us. And like I say, I, I'm an old high school football official. I used to officiate football in Georgia for 25 years, and every time a coach got on me about something, he didn't want me to change the current call. He was influencing the next call. Okay, so we've got to influence this year, but probably much more importantly, we've got to influence next cycle and the cycle after that, the cycle after that. We've got to turn the corner where Fulbright gets cut to where Fulbright gets supported. As we start to close out this session, and thank you so much for responding to these questions, Nicole. I think I'd like to ask one of the questions that has appeared in the chat. Max, John, do you recommend a certain verbal message for when we go into members of Congress's offices? Do you want us to use those numbers? What should be the content of our message, of our ask? What are you? Uh, I would, if John, I may, you start, Max, uh, yeah, you start. Um, the, the message that's been working very well is is about the 
the mission of the Fulbright Scholarship and its and its critical uh, contributions to American security and understanding around the world. What you want to talk about is the importance of person-to-person -person contact. This was the genius of Fulbright, that by going into the field and getting to know average people outside of elites, outside of, of uh, the halls of power, that you are building up goodwill, trust, and understanding uh, all over the world. And uh, that's, that's so, so important uh, to, to our place in the world, and our reputation, and our security. You can also talk about how, as you return, you share those experiences with fellow Americans. You also uh, build international relationships. You, share, you use your skills, your linguistic skills. Again, this is just part of your story, and it's working extremely well. Max, you want to add to that? I just want to agree with you. I think you're right. Uh, we've had several folks saying, will we share the ask? We will. We, we, we're going we're gonna, to uh, work on our final message and our final prep for those of you who might be able to join us in Washington next month. We're going to uh, make sure that we have our talking points uh, concise and consistent. We're going to make sure we're all on the same page. We're going to make sure we all ask for the same thing. We're going to personalize the visit with our individual stories because it's personal. But uh, And then we're going to share it with the chapter so that when you see the members and you see the officials, you can be as consistent as we hope to be in March. And we will be. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm excited. This is fun. If you've never had the privilege of spending a day on Capitol Hill uh, and you can join us, please do. You, you'll have a positive experience. So we've got a we've got a wonderful Fulbright alumni who happens to be the uh, ambassador from Hungary. So we're going to have a reception at the Hungarian ambassador with the hosted by the Hungarian ambassador. You want to hang around on Wednesday night? I'll give you a capital tour, a night tour of the capital. That's kind of fun, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we, it's a fun time. And we, you'll meet with, uh, you know, in the morning we'll we'll start you early and we'll we'll run you late. But we'll start about 7:30 or so in the morning, and we'll be in members' offices by 9 9:30. You'll hit two offices in the morning. We got a great noon program uh, planned, and then two or three offices in the afternoon. And then if you hang, and we'll do a debrief. And if you want to hang, we'll we'll you, when you're exhausted, I'll take you to the house, but uh, to the Capitol. But uh, it's a positive experience, and uh, we I am so delighted that so many of you chose to spend part of your day with us, and uh, and we want to continue this dialogue. I want to especially thank Alex for her leadership. Thank you, Alex, in putting this together. If I can help, that's why I'm here. If, uh, I hope that uh, whatever we do, we can do collectively for the good of Fulbright. So thanks, Alex. Thank you, Max, so much for giving your time today to get us all excited about advocating for the Fulbright program. Thank you. To everyone who joined today, I want to reassure you that, yes, we will follow up with the materials that we were talking about. We will present some written messages that you can use, some suggestions. I will share the slides again that you can forward to your chapter boards. And we will provide that advocacy toolkit to you, as well as a link to the recording of this program uh, today. And you can share that with those from your boards who didn't have a chance to, to join in right now. So again, thank you so much to our Executive Director John Bader for joining today, uh, to Max Burns for walking us through those strategies that we can use to best uh, advocate for the program that has meant so much to all of us. And everyone, thank you for joining. We'll be in touch soon. I will send you the email with links to your advocacy kit and to this webinar. Thank you so much. We'll close out here and follow up by email if you have any questions that are outstanding. All right, I appreciate your participation. Thank you.